15 minutes past midnight, Evers got out of his car beside his home in a Negro residential area. In a vacant lot about 40 yards away, a sniper fired a single shot from a high-powered rifle at Evers' silhouette. The bullet hit him in the back, crashed through his body, through a window into the house. He died within an hour at a Jackson hospital. City detectives believe the fatal shot was fired from this sweet gum tree. They have found a rifle in the bushes which they think is the murder weapon. They say they also have other clues. Mayor Allen Thompson cut short a Florida vacation and rushed back to City Hall where he made this statement. The city of Jackson offers $5,000 reward to anyone who gives evidence leading to the arrest and the conviction of the guilty. In the Negro community, the mood is sullen anger and a desire for revenge. Medgar Wiley Evers was born on July 2, 1925, in Decatur, Mississippi. He was the third of five children, or, according to some sources, the second of four, since they state that his mother potentially had four children. Medgar was the younger brother to Charles Evers, who is also known for his activism. Medgar's mother, Jessie, Nay Wright, has two children from a previous marriage before marrying Medgar's father, James. The Evers owned a small farm with James working at a sawmill. Medgar and his siblings would walk 13 miles a day just to get to school, which back then was segregated. Medgar is described in his early life as having been a serious child with an air of maturity about him. He absorbed his parents' work ethic and strong religious values early on. Medgar and his family encountered overt racism on a daily basis. When he was 12 years old, a family friend was lynched, and the man's bloody clothing were hung on a fence for more than a year as a sign of intimidation. In his teens, he watched as white gangs would patrol the streets on Saturday nights looking for a black target to beat up or run down in their cars. At the age of 14, a family friend named Willie Tingle was dragged behind a wagon on the streets of Decatur, then later shot and hung after being accused of insulting a white woman. When the United States entered World War II, Medgar served in the U.S. Army from 1943 to 1945, which he dropped out of high school to do. He was assigned to a segregated field battalion in England and France, and he was sent to the European Theater, which was an area of heavy fighting during the war, and he fought in the Battle of Normandy in June of 1944. At the end of the war, he was honorably discharged having achieved the rank of sergeant. After his stint in the army, he gained his high school diploma. After a racial incident, Medgar said to his brother, when we get out of the army, we're going to straighten this thing out. In 1948, Medgar enrolled at Alcorn Agricultural and Mechanical College, now known as Alcorn State University, which is located in Lorman, Mississippi. Alcorn is a historically black college founded in 1871. Medgar majored in business administration and competed on the debate, football, and track teams. He sang in the choir and was junior class president among holding several other student offices and was editor of the campus newspaper for two years. Along with that, he was the editor of the annual paper for one year. Medgar graduated in 1952 with a Bachelor of Arts. In recognition for his accomplishments at Alcorn, he was listed in the Who's Who in American Colleges. On Christmas Eve of 1951, Medgar married Merle Beasley, a fellow classmate. They had three children together, Daryl Kenyatta, Rena Denise, and James Van Dyke in Mound Bayou, Mississippi. Mound Bayou is a town developed by African Americans with a 98.6 population. Once in their new town, Medgar became a salesman for TRM Howard's Magnolia Mutual Life Insurance Company. TRM stands for Theodore Roosevelt Mason Howard, an African American activist and civil rights leader during the mid-century of America. 
Medgar also became the president of the Regional Council of Negro Leadership, also known as the RCNL. He began to organize actions for civil rights, and he helped organize the boycott of gas stations that denied black people the use of their restrooms, which gained national attention. Medgar and his brother Charles attended the annual conferences that the RCNL had, which was between 1952 and 1954, which is stated as having drawn crowds of 10,000 people or more. Somewhere during this time period, the Evers family moved to Jackson, Mississippi. Medgar is described as having been a loving father that loved to race with his children and the other kids on the block. His daughter, Rena, has recounted the story of her father always betting her siblings and the other children that he could beat them down the hill as they raced against them on their bikes, and he would always win every time. In 1954, the United States Supreme Court made the decision that segregated schools were unconstitutional. Medgar applied to the state-supported University of Mississippi Law School but he was rejected because of his race, and because of this rejection, he submitted his application as part of a test case by the NAACP. On November 24, 1954, Medgar was named as the first field secretary for the NAACP in Mississippi. He helped organize boycotts and set up new local chapters of the group, and was even with James Meredith's efforts to enroll in the University of Mississippi in the 60s. In 1962, James Meredith was the first African American accepted into the university, which had been historically segregated, and this brought even more hate towards Medgar, and a riot ensued which left two people on campus dead. Medgar was followed, beaten, threatened and mocked while traveling through the state. White supremacist groups that formed after Brown versus Board spied on him. Medgar found great importance in encouraging African American people to vote. He believed that it was everyone's right to vote and to register, and realized that change could be possible if other non-white people were able to vote for who they believed in. There were any number of things in his childhood that uh, really made him acutely aware of the injustices. And as a young man who volunteered to go into the army to fight for his country in World War II, and then come home and find that he was still a second-class citizen, not being able to register and vote, he said, this has to change. And he decided that he would be a part of that change. Medgar is known for investigating cases of injustices and murders of African Americans across the state of Mississippi, including that of Clinton Melton, who was murdered just three months after Emmett Till. In a famous photo of Medgar, he's interviewing Clinton's widow, Beulah, who passed away more than likely being killed before the trial of her husband. Medgar also encouraged Dr. Gilbert Mason Sr. in organizing the Biloxi Wade-Ins from 1959 to 1963, which were protests against the segregation of the city's public beaches. Medgar helped integrate Jackson, Mississippi's privately owned businesses, buses, and tried to integrate the public parks. He led voter registration drives and used boycotts to integrate the schools of Leake County and the Mississippi State Fair. Because of all of his civil rights leadership and investigative work, Medgar became the target of white supremacists. After the Brown v. Board of Education decision to deem segregated schools unconstitutional, local whites founded the White Citizens Council in Mississippi. Local chapters were started in numerous locations to resist desegregation. During a sit-in on March 29, 1961, Medgar was hit on the back of the head with a revolver by a white man in civilian clothing. Then he was hit with a billy club by two unidentified police officers. 
The students that were a part of the sit-in were sprayed with tear gas and struck by police with nightsticks, who also brought their police dogs. When getting out of his car at one time, three policemen looked at Medgar and stated, There he is. We ought to kill him. Medgar stated in a report to the FBI that he did not reply, only smiled, and joined his friends at the parking lot entrance. Before he was even murdered, Medgar encountered newer levels of hostility in the weeks leading up to his death. Medgar continued the NAACP's research on lynching and filed petitions against Jim Crow segregation laws. These laws prevented African Americans from going to movie theaters, eating at restaurants, using public libraries, parks, and pools. Medgar led a public investigation of the lynching of Emmett Till that happened in Mississippi in 1955 with Claude Kennard, who was a prominent black leader, showing vocal support. On May 28, 1963, a Molotov cocktail was thrown into Medgar's home, and barely over a week later, on June 7th, he was nearly run down by a car after he came out of the NAACP office in Jackson, Mississippi. With the threat of white supremacists so strong towards the Evers family, Medgar and Murley taught their kids what to do in the case of a shooting, bombing, or any sort of attack on them. He taught them how to fall to the floor with the sound of gunfire and crawl to the bathroom, the bathtub, and always take care of their little brother. There was a large white supremacist population in Jackson, Mississippi, along with the Ku Klux Klan. Medgar was regularly followed home by at least two FBI cars and one police car. On the morning of his death, he did not have an escort. There has not been any reason specified for this by police or the FBI. There's speculation that many members of the police force at the time were members of the KKK. In video interviews with Murley, she stated that Medgar had been tipped that there was an assassin very likely coming his way. On June 12, 1963, an early Wednesday morning, Medgar pulled into his driveway after returning from a meeting with the NAACP lawyers. Many sources state that this was just hours after the then president, JFK, televised a civil rights address. It is stated that his family worried for his safety that day, with Medgar even warning Murley that he felt like he was in greater danger than usual. When Medgar arrived home, his family was waiting for him, with his children exclaiming to their mother that he had arrived home. Medgar got out of the car, carrying NAACP shirts that read, Jim Crow must go. He was shot in the back with a bullet from an Enfield 1917 rifle, the bullet itself passing through his heart. Medgar's son Daryl stated, We were ready to greet him because every time he came home, it was special for us. He was traveling a lot at that time. All of a sudden, we heard a shot. We knew what it was. And, uh, describe for me that evening. Well, it was an evening that my brother, sister, and I were waiting for my father in anticipation like we usually do. You know, when he came home, we expected him to bring us something. And um, we were watching TV, and all of a sudden we heard a very loud noise, and we heard glass break, then we heard a loud thump. And um, my mother got very excited. Um, she ran, she told us to hit the floor. So we all fell on the floor. And this time I knew it was really serious because we had been attacked before with Molotov cocktails, but never had it been a bullet. And I, and I recognized that some high velocity projectile had come through the house. Um, my mother went to the door and she told us to wait behind. She opened the door and she screamed. Um, I 
that point she ran outside and curiosity got the best of me and I and I walked to the front door and I just stood there and I saw my father um, he was laying in a pool of blood I had a very strong feeling that that my father was taken care of even though he was wounded by an assassin's bullet I felt that his soul was in peace his soul was in rest and I felt that myself when the children heard the gun they ran to the bathroom to hide in the bathtub as previous drills came to the conclusion that the bathtub was the most safest place initially thrown to the ground by the impact of the shot Medgar arose and staggered 30 feet before collapsing outside of his front door. His wife, Merle, was the first to find him. Medgar was taken to the hospital in Jackson, where he was initially refused entry because of his race. His family had to explain who he was, and once they did this, he was allowed to be admitted. Medgar passed away in the hospital 50 minutes later. Medgar ended up as the first African-American admitted to an all-white hospital in Mississippi. After his assassination, an estimated 5,000 people marched from the Masonic Temple on Lynch Street to the Collins Funeral Home on North Ferris Street in Jackson. Alan Johnson, a civil rights activist, and Martin Luther King Jr. led the procession, along with other civil rights leaders. The Mississippi police came prepared with riot gear and rifles in case the protests during the procession turned violent. Though tensions were high in the standoff between the police and the marchers, the protests remained nonviolent. Medgar is buried in Arlington National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. He was 37 years old. The man who killed Medgar was named Byron De La Beckwith. According to a newspaper source from the FBI, a Perlin Byron was nicknamed D. Lay, since his middle name was pronounced that way, and he seemed to move with the same type of motion. Beckwith was born on November 9, 1920, in Calusa, California. Apparently, his father was the postmaster of the town, passing away from pneumonia when Beckwith was five years old. A year later, he and his mother moved to Greenwood, Mississippi, to be near family. His mother then died of lung cancer when he was 12 years old, and he was then raised by his maternal uncle, William Green Yerger, and his wife. In January of 1942, Beckwith enlisted in the Marines and served as a machine gunner in the Pacific Theater of World War II. He was later honorably discharged in August 1945. After serving in the Marines, he moved to Providence, Rhode Island, and married Mary Louise Williams. They then relocated back to Greenwood. The couple had a son together named Byron De La Beckwith, Jr., then later divorced in 1960. In 1954, when the United States Supreme Court ruled that segregation in schools was unconstitutional, he joined the White Citizens' Council and at some point became a member of the KKK. Just days before the murder, Beckwith asked two cab drivers for directions to Medgar's home. On the night of June 12, 1963, Beckwith positioned himself across the street with a rifle and shot Medgar Evers. He abandoned the rifle near the scene, and his fingerprint was found on it later. In January of 1966, Beckwith, along with other members of the KKK, were subpoenaed by the House Un-American Activities Committee to testify about Klan activities. Even though he stated his name, he didn't answer any questions. And years later, he would become a leader in the segregationist Phineas Priesthood, which is an offshoot of the white supremacist Christian identity movement known for their hostility towards African Americans, Jews, 
Catholics, and foreigners. According to Delmar Dennis, Beckwith boasted of his role in the death of Medgar Evers at several KKK rallies and similar gatherings after the mistrials. In 1967, he unsuccessfully sought the Democratic Party's nomination for a lieutenant governor of Mississippi. In 1973, informants alerted the FBI that Beckwith was planning to murder A.I. Botnick, a Jewish civil rights activist. After several days of surveillance, the New Orleans Police Department stopped Beckwith as he was traveling by car on the causeway to New Orleans. In his car were several loaded firearms, a map with highlighted directions to Botnick's house, and a dynamite time bomb. On August 1, 1975, he was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder, serving three years in Angola Prison, Louisiana, from May 1977 to January 1980, where he was paroled. On June 21, 1963, Byron de la Beckwith was arrested for Medgar's murder. He was prosecuted by Bill Waller, who was then the district attorney and later became the governor of Mississippi. There were two juries in February and April of 1964 that both ended up deadlocked with Beckwith's so-called guilt and failed to reach a verdict. The juries for both trials were all white. During the second trial, Governor Ross Barnett interrupted the proceedings to shake hands with Beckwith while Murley was testifying. The White Citizens Council paid for Beckwith's legal expenses in both 1964 trials. There was a huge amount of evidence that should have convicted him. Along with the fingerprints on the rifle, his car was seen in the area near Medgar's home at the time of the killing. Beckwith was able to get two police officers to state that he was far away from Medgar's home when the murder happened. In the 80s, the Jackson Clarion Ledger published reports finding that the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission had assisted Beckwith's attorneys during the second trial. The commission had worked against the civil rights movement in numerous ways, using state resources to investigate members of the jury pool to aid Beckwith and the defense in picking a sympathetic jury. These findings later contributed to the retrial by the state in 1994. Back then, most African Americans were still disenfranchised by Mississippi's constitution and their voter registration practices. It meant that they were excluded from both juries. Even though Beckwith walked free for over 30 years, Merle Evers did not give up on another trial. It was not until 1994 that the state of Mississippi was able to prosecute Beckwith under new evidence. Merle was able to do this once a new judge had been assigned in the county to take her case. During this point in time, Beckwith was living in Signal Mountain, Tennessee. He was married to a new woman named Thelma Neff, who stated that, if men were a fourth as good, we wouldn't have any problems in America. In front of their house, they hung a Confederate flag and didn't seem to be on the best terms with their neighbors. A man named Joseph Wagner stated, He's just a poor fellow who's out of kilter. You can't help but feel sorry for somebody like that. It's kind of pathetic. In this same article, Beckwith admitted to being a white supremacist. During the 1994 trial, when it was coming up, he was held in jail in Hamilton County, Tennessee, awaiting his extradition to Mississippi. His lawyer at the time stated that he was a political prisoner. Before the trial, Beckwith had moved to Tennessee eight years prior, and his neighbors had no idea of the crimes he committed. They described him as polite, though he tried to push subscriptions to right-wing magazines and even tried to get one person to publish an article that said, the Jews are destroying the country. His wife stated that he was such a wonderful Christian and that she was concerned for his health and had a heart condition. She also felt like the Mississippi officials were giving in too much to the blacks. Before the trial, he stated that he was developing a cataract in his right eye that he called 
his shooting eye. Beckwith maintained his innocence. When asked an explanation why, the case was revived 27 years later. He is quoted as saying, On February 5th, 1994, Beckwith was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Later on, he would try to appeal his conviction, but was denied by the Mississippi Supreme Court. On January 21st, 2001, Beckwith died in prison at the age of 80. After Medgar's murder, his widow Murley and the children left the state. The slaying is an inner part of me that still hurts, and that still bleeds, that is still very raw. Her and the children flew to New York for psychiatric treatment several times. We couldn't stay in the house because of the memories there. Every time you walked out of the front door, you could see Medgar's body and blood. It was hard, very hard. She relocated to California and earned a degree in sociology at Pomona College in 1968. She later married a man named Walter Williams in 1976, and they remained together until his death in 1995. In 1987, Murley was named to the Los Angeles Board of Public Works, where she served until 1991. In 1995, she rose to chairman of the NAACP board, later leaving the post in 1998. In 1999, she wrote an autobiography called Watch Me Fly. In 2011, there is an article from the Clarion Ledger from Byron Beckwith Jr., who stated that his father was innocent and that the real murderer of Medgar Evers was still out there somewhere. Medgar's legacy lives on. In 1963, he was posthumously awarded the Spring Arn Medal by the NAACP. Murley wrote a book to him in tribute called For Us, The Living in 1967. In 2013, a 13-foot bronze statue of Medgar was erected at Alcorn State University. In 1970, Medgar Evers College was founded as part of the City University of New York. In 1989, Murley founded the Medgar and Murley Evers Institute to advance the legacy of his life work. Bob Dylan wrote a song to commemorate Medgar called Only a Pawn in Their Game. On October 9, 2009, a dry cargo ammo ship was named after him called the USNS Medgar Evers. The Evers' house at 2332 Margaret Walker Alexander Drive is now a National Historic Landmark, as made so in 2017. In 2001, Medgar's oldest son, Daryl, passed away from colon cancer. He was cremated. In 2020, Medgar's brother, Charles, passed away. He was cremated and had his ashes scattered at the site of his parents' graves.